Yes. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about our uh, study of self incompatibility in crucifers or the Brassicaceae family and how we started our work in cabbages and moved uh, to Arabidopsis. And I have to put some, um, something from the Middle East here. Uh, so this is just to uh, show that uh, people have known for a very long time that some plants need to be manually pollinated to get seed or, or fruit. And um, this is because many plants have mechanisms that prevent self-fertilization. And one of the major such mechanisms is genetic self-incompatibility, which is the system we work on. So self-incompatibility systems are widely distributed uh, among flowering plants, and they evolved independently multiple times. And we know this because the molecular analysis shows that different genes are involved. Uh, they, uh, these systems regulate uh, the interactions between the pollen uh, or pollen tube with cells that line the, of the pistil that line the path of pollen tube growth. Um, and they interrupt the pathway of pollen tube emergence and growth. So in some plant species, self incompatibility is manifest, whoops, I knew this was gonna happen, okay. Uh, is manifested as at the surface of the stigma, as I'll show you for the Brassicaceae family. In other families, incompatibility response is uh, manifested in the style where that's where pollen tubes are inhibited, and in some cases, even uh, in the uh, ovary. Um, so in essence, what even though the uh, molecular basis of these different self-incompatibility system, uh, systems differ in different families, they all have the same uh, end result, which is to allow the pistil to determine what the genetic identity of a pollen grain or pollen tube is relative to its own genetic identity. So if uh, the pistil cell de determines that the genetic makeup is identical to its own, pollination fails. If it's different, then pollination proceeds. So self-incompatible plants have functional male and female gametes, uh, and they are together in the same flower, but they cannot uh, self-fertilize. Um, and they will set a lot of seed only if cross-pollinated uh, by genetically unrelated plants, so they're obligate outbreeders. Um, and uh, self-incompatibility is a mechanism that promotes outbreeding and heterozygosity in plants that have perfect flowers, in which both the female and ma uh, male uh, structures are in close, uh, in close proximity to one another. Um, and and self-incompatibility systems have been used for production of hybrids and um, <coughs> And, and I just want to mention that um, the work I'll be talking about is based on work that was carried out in the Department of Plant Breeding on Brassica self-incompatibility uh, by Don Wallace and his student, Mike Nasrallah. And in fact, the inbred lines that were developed and used in, in those studies are the ones we've used in, in our lab to clone the S. locus genes or the self-incompatibility genes. Okay, so the, all this work was done in, in, initially in brassica. So th these are brassica vegetable crops. There are um, oil crops in the brassicaceae. And of course, there is uh, Arabidopsis thaliana, which is the odd man out here because it's uh, fully self-fertile and pretty small so that our graduate students could grow them in chia pets. Okay, so. Uh, what do we know about self-incompatibility in the Brassicaceae in terms of the site of inhibition? It occurs uh, at the surface of the stigma. Uh, this is a scanning EM picture of a Brassica stigma showing the elongated epidermal cells here that uh, perceive pollen. Uh, in a uh, 
f uh, successful pollination, the pollen adheres, then it hydrates and germinates and the tube grows into the cell wall of a stigma epidermal cell. In a self-incompatibility response, this does not happen, so you have inhibition of pollen hydration, germination, and tube growth at the surface of these cells. Uh, the genetics of self-incompatibility is uh, a little more complicated than this, but uh, let's say this is the, the most simplest manifestation, uh, most simple manifestation of the genetics. The, uh, it's uh, determined by the S locus, which stands for sterility locus. And this locus is extremely uh, polymorphic, and there can be up to uh, 100 variants of this locus in any one species. And if you, if you look at this Punnett square here, you will see that whenever the pollen and the stigma express the same S locus variant, you get inhibition of pollen. In all other situations, uh, you don't. Um, so when I, when I mention self, I mean genetic identity at the S locus only. And non-self means genetic difference at the S locus. So um, as I mentioned, the S locus is extremely polymorphic. There are many variants that occur naturally in any population. And uh, genetically, it seems to be, it, it, is, it behaves as a Mendelian locus. So when we started out this work, we thought we were going to isolate a single gene. It turns out, however, that the S locus is a complex locus that consists of two genes that together determine specificity in the self-incompatibility response. And um, so it, we, we designate each, um, each one of these uh, that containing these two genes as an S locus haplotype. Um, and um, and I, I just have this cartoon here to remind me to tell you that these two genes do not recombine. Um, so the, the linkage of these two genes is very tight. And we believe that's because there are extensive rearrangements and haplotype-specific sequences in the region which prevent uh, uh, forma uh, formation of crossing overs, of pairing and, and crossing overs. Um, at any rate, the first gene that we uh, identified was the S locus receptor kinase, which was uh, analyzed by a graduate student in the lab in 1991, and it took a long time to isolate the second gene, which is the S locus cysteine rich SCR protein uh, encoding gene. And that was identified by Christel Schopfer in 1999. So we had quite a gap. Uh, this guy turned out to be very difficult to um, uh, isolate. So the S locus receptor has a structure uh, typical of single pass transmembrane receptors with a a distinctive extracellular domain uh, that is glycosylated, is cysteine-rich, a transmembrane domain, and a cytoplasmic kinase domain. Uh, the uh, S locus receptor kinase is expressed specifically or predominantly in stigma epidermal cells. Uh, the uh, S locus cysteine-rich uh, protein gene is expressed in the tapetum, um, but then it's um, uh, the, the protein product ends up being a component of the pollen coat. Uh, using biochemistry, uh, biochemical uh, binding studies, Ardra Kashru uh, showed in uh, 2001 that there was high affinity and haplotype specific binding of the cysteine rich protein to the extracellular domain of the uh, receptor. So the, uh, this S locus cysteine rich protein is a ligand for the receptor. And um, so this, uh, the, the SRK receptor is only one of a very few uh, plant receptors for which a ligand is, is known. Okay, so this is how uh, uh, the the stigma or the stigma epidermal cells discriminates between self and non-self pollen. So uh, as I showed you based on the localization studies, the uh, SRK receptor is uh, located on the plasma membrane of a stigma epidermal cell, uh, whereas the SCR is located on the outer coat of the pollen. So uh, 
self-incompatible plants, because their uh, out, uh, obligate outcrossers are usually heterozygous. So we have a stigma here that uh, carries two variants of the S locus, S1 and S3. It expresses receptor type 1 in, in blue and receptor type uh, 3 in, in green. When it encounters a, uh, an, a pollen grain that expresses SCR1, which is a self-pollen, uh, the SCR is delivered to the surface of the stigma, it binds to the extracellular domain of the receptor, activates the receptor, and subsequently there is a signal transduction pathway that causes inhibition of self-pollen. In a non-self or cross-pollination situation, the S2 pollen here will also deliver its SCR, but this SCR is unable to bind or activate receptors type S1 and S3, and therefore pollen, there is no signal transduction pathway, and the pollen is not inhibited. It hydrates and germinates. Uh, and then another point made by this slide, and this is what it looks like, self-pollination, inhibition of pollen, cross-pollination, profuse pollen tube growth. Another point made by this slide is that a single stigma epidermal cell can uh, inhibit self-pollen while allowing the growth of non-self-pollen. So whatever this response is, the signaling in, within the cytoplasm here has to be very localized to the site of pollen uh, stigma epidermal cell interaction. Okay, so uh, this is how self-incompatible plants of the Brassicaceae can distinguish, discriminate between self and non-self. But there are many uh, plants within the Brassicaceae that uh, are self-fertile. So within this particular genus, you can have self-incompatible and self-fertile plants. And this is illustrated here, for example, in Brassicas, you have self-incompatible in red, Brassica oleracea, Brassica napis is typically self uh, compatible or self-fertile. Uh, the same in Capsella. In the genus Arabidopsis, most of the species are self-incompatible, for example, Arabidopsis lyrata, but Arabidopsis thaliana is highly self-fertile, and that's why it's such a good model for uh, genetics. So we were interested, and, and in fact, Arabidopsis thaliana um, wo worldwide, all the accessions that have been isolated, there is not a single example of a functional self-incompatibility system. So they're all self-fertile. And uh, several uh, people in the lab, graduate students and postdocs, have looked at why Arabidopsis thaliana is self-fertile. And it turns out that the major reason it's self-fertile is that all the accessions we've looked at uh, and there are hundreds of them, uh, have a non-functional S locus due to uh, mutations that inactivate either the receptor gene or the ligand gene or both. Uh, there are also mutations at modifier loci that affect expression of self-incompatibility. So the, the switch from outcrossing to selfing um, has largely targeted the S locus genes, but also other genes. So uh, to facilitate analysis of self-incompatibility, uh, which is quite difficult to uh, perform in, in Brassica, uh, we decided to try to transfer the self-incompatibility trait uh, to Arabidopsis thaliana. So as I mentioned, Arabidopsis thaliana is very highly self-fertile. It has an inactive, non-functional S, S locus. So we uh, isolated S locus genes, the receptor and its ligand, uh, pairs of genes from Arabidopsis lyrata. So these are functional genes. We introduced them into Arabidopsis thaliana, and we, uh, we found that we can actually generate Arabidopsis thaliana plants that express self incompatibility. So this essentially tells us that in ex uh, geographical accessions uh, in which we can uh, transfer the self-incompatibility trait, that the major mutation in these, uh, the, 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 the mutations that led to self-fertility in these plants is the S locus uh, mutation, inactivation of the S locus. Because when we introduce functional uh, receptor ligand pairs, we can restore self-incompatibility. So this, this essentially explains 
uh, this uh, switch from obligate outcrossing to self-fertilizing species in the Brassicaceae. Uh, and this is a very, very um, frequent uh, shift in uh, uh, plant evolution from outcrossing to self-fertilization, uh, and which often leads to reproductive isolation. So uh, we, we've only analyzed this in a few uh, genera of the Brassicaceae, Arabidopsis, and Capsella, but it seems to be, it may explain other uh, switches from obligate outcrossers to self-fertilizing species. Okay, so uh, we've then started using this transgenic self-incompatible Arabidopsis tariana model uh, or, or Arabidopsis tariana uh, plants as a model for addressing uh, various questions that are difficult to address in uh, brassicas, which are non-model species, and have uh, very complex uh, genome, uh, genomes and very long life cycles and are not very easy to transform. Or they can be transformed, but it's quite tedious and a very long process. So the questions we address uh, are the genetic basis of uh, evolutionary transitions from outbreeding to selfing that I just mentioned. And we're uh, setting up to um, study the cell biology of the uh, self-incompatibility re response. We've looked at the molecular basis of recognition specificity and uh, allele specificity in the receptor ligand interaction, and then the self-incompatibility signal transduction cascade that actually causes inhibition of uh, pollen. So very quickly, the cell biology of the SI response, uh, it, we haven't progressed very far in terms of uh, the dynamics of the receptor, but uh, a start for this was that we were able to express functional uh, SRK receptor that's um, tagged with a, a fluorescent protein so that we can now visualize it in, uh, by confocal microscopy. And Anne Ray was a graduate student who did some of this work. And as you see here in this picture, we can uh, start by looking at the subcellular localization of the receptor. For example, if we uh, cause plasmolysis by treatment with sodium chloride, you can see that clearly that the mem plasma membrane retracted with the uh, SRK signal and what's left are the hectian strands. And these, this is a typical uh, uh, picture obtained with plasma membrane proteins. I just want to mention uh, that sodium chloride is used by breeders to um, obtain seed in self-incompatible plants. And uh, there, there has been no explanation for why that works. And it, it, uh, I, I would like to suggest that because the uh, plasma membrane has retracted, it's far away from the SCR ligand, so there's no signaling that can take place, and you get uh, compatible uh, pollinations. Uh, the other question is uh, the molecular basis of recognition specificity and how the uh, recognition repertoire has been di uh, was diversified to generate all the large numbers of variants of the receptor and the ligand. Uh, so pretty much the specific question we ask is which residues in the uh, receptor and its ligand determine their uh, allele-specific interaction and the recognition specificity. And this is an interesting question in the context of uh, co-evolution of receptor ligand pairs. Uh, it's very puzzling when you have a two-component system to understand how the two components uh, co-evolve to maintain their interaction. And the larger question is how uh, were new self-incompatibility specificities repeatedly generated in this two-component system. And um, so the difficulty is that to generate a new specificity, you have to have a mutation in one component. And if that mutation uh, eliminates the interaction uh, between the receptor and the ligand, then you have to wait around until there's a second mutation in the second component that will restore the interaction. And that's very hard to uh, explain. And I'm not 
uh, we, we, still, we obviously we don't have an answer uh, to this question, but uh, we're beginning to we, we've begun to address uh, the molecular basis of recognition specificity. Um, and uh, here we go back to Brassica, and uh, this is uh, to show this slide shows you. Uh, some properties of the uh, S-locus cysteine-rich uh, ligand. It's a small, uh, about 50 amino acid peptide. It's extremely polymorphic, so within a species, if you look at alleles of, these, uh, of, of this uh, protein, you find there are only eight conserved cysteines, a glycine, and an aromatic position at this, uh, aromatic amino acid at this position. So extremely, extremely polymorphic. Uh, alleles can exhibit as much as 70% sequence divergence. It's probably one of the most polymorphic proteins known. So we were able to determine uh, which residues in the SCR are important for specificity in Brassica because we have a pollination bioassay for SCR in Brassica. And so we can express SCR in bacteria and uh, uh, pipette it onto uh, the surface of stigmas. So here we have an S6 stigma. Uh, it will inhibit S6 pollen but allow uh, the uh, pollen tube for germination and tube growth from S13 uh, pollen. Now if we uh, treat stigma, the S6 stigma with SCR6 uh, protein expressed in bacteria, what happens is that now all the SRK receptors are going to be activated, and now you have inhibition of both self and cross pollen. The control for this experiment is to pipette the same preparation onto an S2 stigma, and in this case, there's no uh, activation of the receptor, and both S6 and uh, self and uh, non, uh, in, sorry, S6 and S13, which are both cross pollen, uh, will not be inhibited. So using this assay uh, and modeling of the uh, SCR peptide, uh, 3D modeling, we found that despite this high polymorphism, all of the SCR peptides assume this defensin-like cysteine-stabilized uh, alpha-beta fold. Um, and looking at this, um, we de decided that to look at, to focus on these two loops that seem to be sticking out of the uh, molecule. Um, and uh, Tana Chukajorn, a graduate student in the lab, uh, proceeded to make mutants and domain swaps between two variants of SCR. And he found, in fact, that uh, only four residues within this loop were sufficient to confer uh, spe the, in this case, a six specificity on another variant. So if you insert TDTQ into this variant here, it becomes, it assumes the specificity of this variant. Now for, for the, um, the S locus receptor, we focus on the extracellular domain, which is the ligand binding domain. And as you can see here, analysis of various, pairwise analysis of um, uh, various uh, uh, alleles of SRK show that you have polymorphisms throughout this 400 amino acid uh, region. There is a, some clustering in hypervariable regions here, but uh, there are a lot of polymorphisms. About out of 400 amino acids, 200 are poly polymorphic. Um, <clears throat> so. This is very impractical to analyze in Brassica because identification of the specificity determined. We don't have a pollination bioassay for this. So we have to uh, look, uh, analyze in planta large numbers of mutant versions of uh, SRK. So we decided to do this in Arabidopsis. And to be able to do this in Arabidopsis, we need to introduce several S locus variants, different S, S uh, self incompatibility specificities. So the sources of S locus variants we had were of course, oops, were of course uh, brassicas. Brassic, we had many uh, SRK SCR uh, gene pairs. Uh, we had one from Capsella, several from Arabidopsis lyrata. And 
we started introducing these various gene pairs into Arabidopsis thaliana, and we found that none of the brassica alleles we used uh, functioned in Arabidopsis thaliana, whereas um, the gene pairs from Capsella or uh, Lyrata did function, or most of them did function. So Nathan Boggs, a graduate student in the lab, uh, introduced five different specificities into Arabidopsis thaliana. Uh, and uh, as you see here, they behave exactly as they would in a naturally self-incompatible uh, species. Uh, when the, they're shared, the alleles are shared by pollen and stigma, you get incompatibility. He then proceeded to um, generate uh, constructs in which he swapped various domains of the extracellular domains uh, or regions and made single amino acid substitutions in two sets um, of uh, variants. He generated more than 100 uh, constructs, all of which he introduced into Arabidopsis thaliana and uh, analyzed at least 12 transformants from each construct and uh, got the, oh, okay. The result was that out of the 200 uh, or so amino acids that are polymorphic, um, in the extracellular domain of SRK, only six in, or, or, uh, or five, six or seven uh, in any one S locus ver uh, SRK variant uh, is important for specificity. So very few, again, just like the SCR, very few polymorphisms are actually relevant for specificity. And it's possible that these um, uh, these two regions where you have these specificity determinants might form a ligand binding pocket, but we don't know that. And we don't have a 3D structure of the extracellular domain. Um, so the, um, if, from, based on these studies of the chimeric and site-directed mutants of SRK and SCR, it seems that uh, the, the backbones of the molecules can tolerate extensive amino acid changes. Um, and the, the majority of polymorphic sites are not important for specificity. And we believe that they're just there because these alleles are very ancient, very old. Um, so acquisition of a novel specificity can result from uh, a, a change in very few uh, a small number of amino acids, which makes it a little more uh, or easier to uh, understand how you generate so many um, new specificities. It still doesn't address the, the problem of coevolution, but at any rate, this is where we're at with this one. Okay, so the uh, last part I want to talk about is um, our efforts at understanding what happens after uh, perception of the pollen grain by the stigma epidermal cell um, and the signaling, uh, the signal transduction pathway so that we can explain why, how pollen is inhibited. Okay, so there is currently a model of uh, SRK signaling that is based on studies in Brassica. And this is largely the work, work carried out in uh, Gold, Takayama, and Goring labs. So the, the, the model uh, states that in the absence of uh, self of pollination, the SRK forms oligomers, and um, these oligomers are kept inactive uh, by, the, uh, by binding to uh, thyroidoxin. It's very important for the uh, activity of the receptor to be very tightly regulated, because if it's not, the plant is going to be sterile. Uh, so we want, the, the, the system has to be activated only upon self-pollination. So this is a, a, uh, an explanation that has been uh, put forward. Um, another part of this model is that um, the exocyst is a, uh, in, the stigma in the stigma epidermal cell um, secretes compatibility factors that are necessary for pollen tube growth to proceed. And now when uh, you have self-pollination, SCR is delivered to the uh, stigma cell wall. Um, it binds to uh, the extracellular domain of the receptor 
activates and, and by so doing, it knocks off the thyroidoxin. This allows activation of the kinase. Uh, then there is a protein called uh, uh, M locus protein kinase, which becomes phosphorylated. Another protein uh, called ARC1, the arm repeat containing protein 1, becomes phosphorylated. ARC1 is an E3 ubiquitin ligase. Um, so the idea, the, the model states that it ubiquitinates a component of the exocyst called XO70A1, uh, thereby causing degradation of XO70A1, and compatibility factors are not secreted and pollen is inhibited. So this makes sense. So we decided to uh, test the uh, signaling model uh, in Arabidopsis saliana. And um, so a, a uh, postdoc in the lab, Masa Yamamoto, decided to test whether thyroidoxins are actually required to keep uh, SRK in an inactive state. Uh, so remember, thyroidoxin binding co uh, keeps SRK in an inactive state, and once it's off, it, SRK is, becomes active. So the prediction here is that if you disrupt the SRK thyroidoxin interaction, you would have constitutive activation of the self incompatibility response, and, and the stigma will be able to inhibit cross pollen, not only self pollen, but cross pollen. So Masa uh, looked at uh, plants that were transformed with SRK, but uh, carried mutations in stigma-expressed thyroidoxin genes. So there's no longer any thyroidoxin in those stigma epidermal cells. And he found that there was no effect on uh, either uh, cross-pollination or self-pollination. So, in Arabidopsis saliana, self-incompatibility, uh, uh, the SRK does not require thyroidoxin for it to be inactive. Okay, we, uh, we also looked at uh, the involvement of uh, these other three players, ARC1, MLPK, and XO70. So uh, we looked at null mutations in the orthologs of MLPK. Uh, we looked at uh, ARC1. We found that Arabidopsis thaliana has a completely decayed ARC1. So there's no ARC1 in, in the species. Um, and we overexpressed XO70A1. And in no case um, did we observe breakdown or weakening of self incompatibility. So, how to explain this discrepancy? We don't believe that Arabidopsis thaliana could have invented a new mechanism for inhibition of self-pollen just when we introduced two genes. Uh, that doesn't seem to make sense. So uh, a possible, but I believe unlikely explanation for the discrepancy is that there may be multiple self-incompatibility signaling pathways as shown here, not only this proposed pathway, and that there may be differential utilization of these pathways in different species. I find this unlikely, but anyway, this is where we're at with this uh, particular um, study. So our approach for getting at components, additional components of the self-incompatibility response is to do mutagenesis in Arabidopsis thaliana. And everybody knows Arabidopsis saliana is perfectly suited for mutagenesis. And this work was, uh, is, is being carried out by a, a research associate, uh, Titima Tantikanjana, in the lab. OK, so to reiterate, we introduced self-incompatibility uh, self into Arabidopsis saliana. Um, the, in many accessions, like C24, CVI, CAS, SHA, and Hodja, Introducing the SRK-SCR gene pair causes stable self-incompatibility, and these plants do not set seed. Now, this is a problem, because we, we wiped out the major advantage of Arabidopsis for mutagenesis, which is seed production. Okay? So fortunately, so yeah, no seed set. So fortunately, there are some accessions that express transient self-incompatibility. For example, Colombia. When we introduce SRK-SCR gene pairs into Colombia, 
we, find, we, we see expression of self-incompatibility in younger flowers, but not in older flowers. And that's why it's, it's transient. And we've shown, or, or Pei Liu, a postdoc in the lab, showed that this was due to a modifier that, down, that affects the level of SRK uh, in, in the stigma. But at any rate, uh, these plants, uh, because of this transient self-incompatibility, will set seed. They set a lot of seed. So it's possible then to do mutagenesis of these uh, SRK, SCR expressing Columbia plants um, and look for a breakdown of self-incompatibility at a stage where in wild type there is self-incompatibility or enhancement of self-incompatibility at a stage where self-incompatibility breaks down. So we can look for both um, uh, suppressors and enhancers of self-incompatibility. And I'll talk to you about a mutation that causes enhanced self-incompatibility. So uh, this is the wild type, Columbia SRK SCR transformant, that's a uh, lot of seed because of this transient self-incompatibility. The mutant that Titima isolated does not set seed. And it, in the older flowers, it expresses a strong self-incompatibility response at a stage where the wild type uh, Cause, uh, shows breakdown of self-incompatibility. Um, this uh, mutation is a recessive mutation that uh, disrupts the uh, RNA-dependent RNA, RNA uh, polymerase RDR6 gene, uh, which is uh, involved in the production of transacting silencing RNAs, or, or transacting TASI RNAs. Um, so this was pretty disappointing initially. <laughs> because um, we were not too crazy about getting into small RNA biology. We were after signaling. At any rate, um, another an interesting feature of this um, mutation is that not only does it enhance self-incompatibility, but it also causes stigma exertion, as you see here. The stigma is much, the, the, um, is in, in um, in Columbia wild type, the stigma is positioned at the same level as the anthers in mature flowers, whereas here it's exerted above the anthers. And uh, Titima showed by electron microscopy that this is due to elongation of the pistil due to increased cell number in, in the pistil. So uh, we thought this association of self-incompatibility enhancement and stigma exertion was uh, interesting. And Titima pursued this uh, some more. And uh, she found that this is just shows you this enhancement uh, in, the, in the RDR6 mutant. Um, and in fact, um, Titima showed that just transforming uh, Columbia RDR6 uh, mutant with SRK by itself, without SCR, will also cause the stigma exertion. Um, and also, she showed that you, you, this phenomenon of sigma exertion required a catalytically active SRK, uh, which means that you need signaling of SRK. And um, uh, the, I just want to mention that SRK is expressed in the style and ovary to a lesser extent than in the stigma. And it seems that whatever it's doing to enhance stigma exertion, is uh, it does in an SCR independent manner because we don't need SCR for this. Uh, so th this mutation uncovered a dual role for SRK signaling in self incompatibility and pistil development and showed that there's quite a bit of integration between the two. And this is interesting in the context of coevolution of self incompatibility and stigma exertion. Many self incompatible plants exhibit stigma exertion. And this is an example from Solanum species taken from uh, Chen and Tanksley uh, paper, where it shows that wild uh, self-incompatible species are, have stigma exertion, whereas the cultivated one does not, the self-compatible one does not. Um, so th this association between self-incompatibility and stigma exertion is puzzling because they're really redundant mechanisms for, that promote uh, outcrossing. Uh, and it has often been uh, asked why, if, if there is an adaptive advantage to have an additional morphological barrier to self-fertilization, 
in, in addition to self-incompatibility. And people have proposed that it promotes pollen transfer, reduces pollen wastage, or self-pollen interference. Um, Titima's results show that uh, the coevolution of self-incompatibility and stigma exertion, at least in, in uh, Brassicaceae, seems to be due to pleiotropy because the same genes are involved in both processes, RDR6 and, and SRK. So anyway, the important question is, what are the targets of these transacting silencing RNAs that are required for self-incompatibility and stigma exertion? And this is a very uh, abbreviated uh, diagram of the pathway for producing trans, uh, uh, transacting silencing RNAs that lead to target uh, RNA degradation. Uh, this is RDR6 here, and one of the known uh, the, some of the known targets of RDR6 or the TASI RNAs produced by RDR6 are the auxin response factors. Uh, ARF, uh, they're called ARFs. And we focused on ARF3 because it had been shown to be expressed in, uh, to be involved in pistol development. So uh, Titima then proceeded to overexpress and uh, to look at overexpression phenotypes and um, mutant phenotypes of uh, R3 in the context of self incompatibility. So um, she expressed a, a TASI RNA insensitive R3 in Columbia SRK SCR transformants. So uh, expressing this insensitive form means it's equivalent to overexpressing R3 because it's not going to be degraded. Its RNA is not going to be degraded. Uh, so as you can see here, you get uh, enhancement of self incompatibility in plants, in stigmas, that, in, in pistils that overexpress uh, R3, and there's no effect on uh, cross uh, pollination. And a loss of function R3 uh, mutation abolishes self incompatibility in younger flowers. So you have here the stage where Columbia transformants are incompatible and you have compatibility here. So overexpression enhances self-incompatibility, loss of function uh, eliminates self-incompatibility. And an interesting um, finding here is that R3 and, uh, and the SRK gene are not expressed in the same cells. So this is, this is showing uh, predominant exp expression of SRK in the stigma epidermal cell, the location of the protein, at the surface of the stigma epidermal cell. In contrast, the R3 promoter and the R3 protein is, expressed, is not expressed in stigma epidermal cell, but is expressed in the style and over in the vasculature. So whereas overexpression of R3 under the control of the R3 promoter causes enhanced self-incompatibility, overexpression of R3 under control of a uh, ATS1 promoter, which is specific to the stigma epidermal cells, does not cause enhancement of self-incompatibility. Similarly, if we look at expression of uh, the effect of R3 overexpression on expression of the auxin responsive DR5 GUS reporter in stigma epidermal cells, we see the same picture. So this is what DR5 GUS looks like, the, the pattern of staining in Columbia wild type. Uh, in the R3 promoter, R3 uh, overexpressors, we no longer see expression of, of DR5 GUS. And this is consistent with the previous uh, data indicating that R3 is a transcriptional repressor of auxin responses. Now, if we express uh, the uh, overexpress R3 under the control of the stigma specific promoter ATS1, we don't affect the uh, distribution of the stain, the gas activity in these plants. So, essentially, what this is telling us is that R3 acts non cell autonomously from its site of expression in the vasculature of the style to regulate self incompatibility and auxin responses in stigma epidermal cells. So this uh, leads us to where we're at now, a model for how R3 uh, regulates self-incompatibility 
in uh, the uh, Brassicaceae uh, family. So we are assuming that uh, we need to dampen auxin responses in the stigma epidermal cells for uh, self-incompatibility signaling to proceed. We're also um, proposing that R3 in the style uh, regulates um, a mobile signal that uh, moves into the stigma epidermal cells and uh, regulates auxin responses and thereby self-incompatibility signaling. And we're in the process of uh, testing this, this hypothesis. Okay, so to summarize, uh, I told you about how we're using the um, Arabidopsis thaliana transgenic self-incompatible model to study uh, self-incompatibility signal perception and diversification of the self-recognition repertoire, self-incompatibility signal transduction, mutagenesis that uncovered this connection between self-incompatibility signaling uh, in, in, cell, uh, in a pollen inhibition and uh, pistil development, and I touched briefly on um, mating system evolution. Uh, so eventually, I suppose, understanding, getting, having a mechanistic understanding of the self-incompatibility response, uh, trying to uh, identify modifiers uh, that affect this response, like in various accessions of Arabidopsis, might allow transfer of self-incompatibility to other plant species. And certainly they may help developing uh, new improved strategies for hybrid breeding and hybrid seed production in the Brassicaceae family. And perhaps at a later date, an apt title for this talk might be From Cabbages to Arabidopsis and Back. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you.